Hey guys, chapter 12. Might have to be broken up in two parts because it's a longer chapter, but we'll see. Anyway, here we go. August choked the city. The morning sun had to burn its red path through low-hanging hazes and clouds of industrial smoke. The streets steamed as concrete reflected heavy sunlight. The temperature climbed until one in the afternoon and then continued climbing. When it rained, fat gray drops plopped down upon the roads, then bounced up as if in a half-hearted attempt to escape. At evening, darkness gradually smothered the sun until night fell upon the city. Dicey rose early every morning, cooked their breakfasts, cleaned the kitchen, walked her family to their daily activities, and hurried back to pick up her equipment and wash whatever store windows were on her schedule for the day. Then she completed whatever housekeeping chores Cousin Eunice had assigned before she went to fetch her family, played briefly with them, prepared dinner, and made Cousin Eunice's cup of tea. Weekends were a little different. For those two afternoons, the Tillermans could go off to a park or a public beach after they had completed the morning chores, or after Maybeth had returned from church with Cousin Eunice. Sometimes it was more convenient for Dicey to meet Maybeth at the church if they were going to picnic at the park, or if Cousin Eunice had friends she wanted to visit with. Dicey would wait outside the big brick building, waiting for the heavy doors to be opened from within. The steeple stretched tall up into the sky. There was a gold cross on top of the steeple, and from below it, it looked like the tip of the cross scratched the bottom of the sky. When the doors opened, Dicey watched carefully for her sister. Lots of children went to church with their parents, all of them dressed up. The girls wore organdy dresses and party shoes and ribbons in their hair or hats. The boys wore real suits and ties. Cousin Eunice always walked out slowly, surrounded by a group of women who could have been her sisters. They dressed alike. They all wore those high-heeled shoes. They all had hair curled... They had all curled their hair into sausages. These women made a pet out of Maybeth. She would stand in the middle, in the middle, and they would tell her how pretty she was, how lucky she was to have naturally curly hair, and what a sweet, quiet girl she was. You're going to break some hearts for sure, they said, giggling. Maybeth listened to this and smiled foolishly. An angel like you? Nobody will be good enough for you. She's a treasure, Eunice, they said. Don't I know it, cousin Eunice answered smugly. A doll, a perfect doll. Daisy put her hands behind her back and clenched her fists, waiting for Cousin Eunice to see her. When Cousin Eunice called her, the women stepped back and smiled primly at her. Maybeth put out her hand for Dicey to take. Her eyes were wide as she looked at Dicey, wide and pleased with the attention. The silly smile stayed. Sat Sunday afternoons, the Tillermans chose to go to a small park nearby because on summer weekends it was less crowded than the beach. There were trees there and grass. And several times, Dicey saw Mr. Platernus in the park, who greeted her warmly with, How's my go-getter today? Nobody commented on this except James, but Dicey abruptly changed the subject. She found a time soon after to talk with Cousin Eunice to try to explain the situation with Sammy. You've got to be cooperative at camp, Dicey said. I don't like them, Sammy said. Don't like who, the boys or the teachers? Don't like any of them. Why not? They're all bossy. That's all he would say. His little jaw stuck out, and he played, pulled at blades of grass as they sat by the sandbox. We've got a problem, Sammy, Dicey said. We have to please Cousin Eunice. The way for you to help is to cooperate at camp, act more friendly. Why? Sammy asked. So we can all stay together with Cousin Eunice, Dicey said. When Mama comes, we won't have to. And I don't want to anyway. Dicey sighed. She didn't much want to herself. She daydreamed about Chris Field and a farm, but she had learned her lesson about believing in daydreams, learned it from Cousin Eunice, and her house that wasn't a big white house by the ocean. Would you do it for James and Maybeth and me? Dicey asked him. Would you try for us? I know it's hard. I know you get angry. But we need you to try. When we were on our own, you stopped quarreling and helped, remember? Sammy nodded. You liked that, didn't you? Sammy nodded. All I want you to do is be more that way at camp. Can you try? Sammy nodded. You sound like Mama, he said. What do you mean? Well, you do. When she'd asked me to be gooder, that was the way she'd talk. He ran off to join Maybeth on the swings. Dicey watched him catch a flying swing and leap onto it, then pump furiously with his sturdy little legs. When he caught up with Maybeth, he cheered for himself. Day succeeded day in slow procession. Cousin Eunice treated Dicey differently since their talk. She wanted to sit with Dicey in the kitchen every night with cups of tea, which Dicey could never completely drink, and talk about religion and serving God and how, and how when she was a girl she had wanted to be a nun. But her mother said she wasn't strong enough in spirit, didn't have a real calling, should wait to see if she got married. 
Stacy listened. She began to feel sorry for Cousin Eunice, who had lived all of her life in this city, who had gone off to work every morning along the same gray city streets. Stacy didn't like the sound of Aunt Sola. She had lied to Mama in her letters. It seemed to Dicey that Aunt Sulla had tried to keep Cousin Eunice all for herself. And then, Dicey thought to herself as the soft voice droned on about service and prayer, just when Cousin Eunice was about to do what she'd always wanted, the Tillemans turned up to tie her down again. Poor Cousin Eunice. If that had happened to Dicey, she'd be angry. Cousin Eunice wasn't angry at all, just sad sometimes, as if this was the way her whole life had to be, not getting what she wanted, always giving it up for the sake of someone else. Maybe she enjoyed giving things up for the sake of someone else. Some people liked that feeling. But even if that was the case, Dicey knew her cousin would rather have been a nun. That was what she really wanted. It wasn't very much to want, and she didn't even have that. The money in Dicey's shoebox increased slowly, day by day. Sixty-five, seventy, which, with the fifty dollars she had left from the car, made one hundred and twenty. Then one hundred and forty dollars, one hundred and fifty. Maybeth came home from camp with a note addressed to Miss Tillerman. The note requested Dicey to come to camp the next afternoon at two, an hour before the children went home. Somebody named Sister Berenice wanted to talk to her. Dicey didn't want to go. She knew what the sister would say. She read the note and reread it. She considered throwing it away and pretending she had never gotten it, as Mama had done. She ripped it up into little pieces and dropped them into the waste paper basket. She didn't want to hear whatever the sister had to say about Maybeth being retarded and needing a special school. James was no help. He seemed convinced that the fathers, and the nuns too, couldn't make a mistake. Go and talk to her. Maybe she knows something we don't. Maybe she knows something that can help Maybeth. Just plan to learn from her about whatever she has to say. You've got to keep an open mind, I see. You've got to leave a door open so understanding can get in. That's one thing I've learned. It's not just minds, Dicey said. You all think it's just smartness that counts, but Stuart didn't think that, and I don't think I do either. I don't want to go. Suit yourself, James said. I'd go. I'm not you, Dicey said. But she kept the appointment, wearing one of the second-hand dresses that made her feel stiff and awkward because they never fit properly. She wore sneakers because they were the only shoes she had. She held her chin high and a little angry. She knew Maybe she knew Maybeth, and this woman didn't. Sister Berenice waited for Dicey in one of the classrooms next to the camp playground. It was a room for very small children. All the chairs were small. The tables didn't even come up to Dicey's knees. Sister Berenice rose from her desk when Dicey came into the long room. The sister was very tall and very thin. She wore a black suit with a longish skirt, and her face was framed by the cowl she wore. She had pale blue eyes, and her mouth looked stern. When she pulled up one of the little chairs for Dicey to sit on, Dicey saw with surprise that she wore a silver wedding ring on her right hand. "'You're a child,' Dicey said. She said, and Dicey nodded. I asked Maybeth, Sister Berenice said, sounding cross. I asked her who was her guardian, and she said Dicey, her sister. I asked if you were married, and Maybeth said no. Well, actually, she just shook her head. It is the longest conversation we have had. I didn't think to ask Father Joseph how old you were. Who is the person legally responsible for Maybeth? Our cousin Eunice, I guess, Dicey said, until they find our mother. Miss Logan, Sister Berenice murmured in apparent disbelief. She took us in. She didn't have to do that, Dicey said. She'd never even heard of us. She wanted Sister Berenice to appreciate what Cousin Eunice had done. She wanted to appreciate it herself. How old are you? She asked Dicey. Dicey's temper flared. I'm 13. How old are you? A smile bent the corners of Sister Berenice's pale mouth. 53. Old enough to recognize spirit when I meet it. Tell me about your sister, Dicey. Dicey stared at her in surprise. For a minute, she couldn't think of anything to say. Usually people told her about Maybeth, and she tried to explain that they were wrong. Nobody had ever asked her first. She's shy, Dicey said. She almost never speaks to strangers, and people always want to speak to her because she's pretty. Usually she stays stiff and quiet and stares with big eyes. She doesn't even talk to us much, but when she does, it's always the right thing to say. Not right polite, right true. Sister Berenice sat listening with folded hands, so Dicey went on. I don't know why Maybeth is the way she is, but she's always been that way. From the time she started school, her teachers thought she was stupid. I guess I can understand that. She would be so quiet that you'd think she didn't know anything. She stayed back one year in first grade. Then the teacher wanted to keep her back this year, or at least that's what I think. Mama almost never opened those notes. 
You said she almost never speaks to strangers. That means she sometimes does. Who does she speak to? Daisy told her how Maybeth had talked to Stuart and sung with him. She sings. It's lovely when she sings. She learned songs fast, music and words. She couldn't be retarded and do that, could she? Sister Bernice just smiled. And she can read, Dicey said. Not like Jane's, but as well as Sammy. She used to read to me at home when I asked her to. And she can add and subtract, Dicey thought. She's not quick, but she can work the problems out. It just takes her a longer time to learn school things, and she's just too shy to say what she knows. When she plays, she builds gardens and castles and makes up stories about them. Dicey had never before defined so exactly just what Maybeth could and could not do. I guess she's slow at school, but I don't think she's retarded or anything like that. Would you like to go look out the window at the children? Sister Bernie says Dicey. Puzzled, Dicey obeyed. The playground was surrounded by a tall fence. Little groups of children were gathered about, playing or reading or listening to one of several nuns who were out there with them. Dicey's eyes searched for Maybeth among the many little girls. She found her, sitting in a circle around a nun with a guitar. Maybeth sat behind the group. Her dress, like Dicey's, was long and dark. Her face was round and sad. All the other little girls were singing and clapping their hands, but Maybeth was staring at the nuns' hands as they played on the instrument. She was not singing. She was not clapping. The nun stopped playing and said something, at which all the little girls jumped up and ran to different parts of the playground. Maybeth didn't move. The nun bent to speak to her, and she looked up. But she looks frightened, Dicey said. Why does she look frightened? She heard the rude, demanding tone of her own voice. Sister Berenice didn't answer. I see what you mean, Dicey said. Maybeth did look different from all the other little girls. Dicey watched her sister walk slowly over to the swings. She stood there. Several girls were swinging energetically. There were some unoccupied swings, but Maybeth didn't get onto one. The other girls paid no attention to her. It was as if Maybeth wasn't even there, not even to herself. What was wrong with her? She looked empty. But she isn't that way, Dicey started to say. I wonder, Sister Berenice said in a voice that suggested doubt. Sister Berenice didn't believe Dicey. Why should she? Father Joseph said that you were unusual, Sister Berenice said to Dicey. He did? Yes, the rich voice assured Dicey that this was the truth. To keep your family together and fed. But I wonder if you have faced the truth about Maybeth. I think you may be fooling yourself. This too, Dicey recognized, was the truth. Maybe she was. Maybe. Do you know the kind of special schooling available to a child like Maybeth? Not through us, of course, but the state maintains excellent facilities for disabled children. There is much they can learn and do, such children, if they are properly taught. Is it fair to Maybeth to deny her the opportunity just because you don't want to face the facts? No, Dicey said. The word burst from her. I don't think you want, I didn't think you wanted to do that to Maybeth. No, Dicey said again. Those aren't the facts. Oh, now, this nun said. She sounded disappointed in Dicey. Dicey sighed. I'm sorry, she said. I don't mean to be rude. Are you thinking of Maybeth or of yourself? Sister Berenice asked quietly. Dicey didn't know and she didn't care. She was too tired and discouraged to think of an answer. This nun had already made up her mind anyway. Dicey didn't want to think about Maybeth anymore. She was arguing more from habit than conviction. You just don't know, she repeated. I think I probably know better than you do. Dicey was finished arguing. She just wanted to get out of there and take Maybeth with her. Can Maybeth come with me now? It's almost time. The nun stared at her for a long time. Finally, she answered, yes, of course. But her voice said more. It told Dicey that the sister was sorry she had asked Dicey to come in. Well, Dicey was sorry too. She nodded, then left the room. Dicey entered the playground through the tall iron gates. She started to walk over to where Maybeth was, but a young nun came and asked her what she was doing there. She sounded important, as though she was accustomed to being obeyed without question. Dicey explained who she was. She said that she had been meeting with Sister Berenice and had permission to take Maybeth home. The young nun looked back at the windows behind them and stood aside. Maybeth had seen Dicey. She smiled at her, but did not come running as Sammy would have. Dicey smiled back and hoped the way she was feeling didn't show in her face. Let's go get Sammy, she said, holding out her hand. Sammy had a cut on his forehead that someone had covered with a big band-aid. His lip was swollen. Oh, Sammy. Dicey couldn't keep the worry out of her voice. You said you'd try. I did. You were in a fight, Dicey said, and a pretty bad one. He said, who, who said? 
Johnny. I don't know his last name, and I don't care. He's a big kid. He's in fourth grade. I made him cry, and I didn't even cry. What did he say? He said I was going to a foster home because nobody here likes me. He said he heard the father saying it. It's not true, is it, Dicey? So I fought him. What did the father say? Johnny's the one that heard them. He said they didn't know he could hear. No, no. I mean, when they stopped the fight. They did stop the fight, didn't they? Sammy nodded. They were walking to James's school. Dicey held one, one hand of each of the little ones. There was too much bad news in this day. Sammy nodded. I'm oh, sorry. They didn't say nothing. We didn't tell them nothing. So they think it's all your fault, don't they? Sammy nodded. I have to stay inside alone tomorrow. All day. Oh, Sammy, why didn't you tell them what Johnny said? Because they try to find out everything. What's a foster home? You didn't know and you fought about it? It's not good, is it? I could tell that from how he said it. Dicey sighed. A foster home is where somebody not your own family takes you into their home to live and somebody gives them allowance to pay for you. You wouldn't let them do that, would you, Dicey? I told Johnny, and he said you couldn't stop them. Dicey felt helpless, absolutely helpless, with the two little ones holding her hands. She knew how Sammy felt. She wanted to fight somebody herself, or to run fast, not waiting for lights to change. But she had the two little ones holding on to her. There's James now, she said to Sammy. Sammy ran to meet his brother. James was walking quickly, a huge smile on his face. At least one of us is happy, Dicey thought. Dicey called the bus station and found out that it cost $26 to get to Crisfield, $52 there and back, so she would still have some money so she wouldn't be dependent. She would stay in a hotel or something for a couple of days. It was only for a couple of days, until she took a look at this grandmother to see for herself. She purchased a small overnight case at the Goodwill store. She located the bus station in Bridgeport. There, she picked up a bus schedule and found out that if she left Bridgeport at 10 o'clock in the morning, she would have to change at New York for Wilmington. At Wilmington, she decided by looking at a map, she would try to get a bus to take her down to Easton, then Salisbury, then Crisfield. Easton and Salisbury were yellow on the map, so they were big towns. They would be sure to have buses. This was on a Thursday. She thought she would go the next Monday so that the little ones would be in camp during the day while she was away. James could take charge for four days. That was all she'd be gone for. They would just have to get along without her for four days. There was no way she could take them with her, just as there was no way she could tell Cousin Eunice she was going. That evening, Cousin Eunice came home late from work carrying a bakery bag. Father Joseph called me at work. He's bringing your friend by after supper, after the children are in bed, she said. I got a cake on my way home. Did you get the living room done today? It's Thursday. Dicey nodded. Father Joseph said you have already met this man, a policeman? I have not. Did you wash the windows? Dicey had forgotten that. She lied. Well, it wasn't an entire lie since she had washed windows that day. She just hadn't washed the windows Cousin Eunice mints. And a good vacuuming? I don't know. The house gets so dirty with all you children. I don't know how you managed to collect so much dirt and bring it inside. She fluttered about the kitchen, fussing over one thing and another, looking in the icebox for lemons and the cupboard to be sure her good teapot was clean and there was sugar in the sugar bowl. It could not be good news they brought. Dicey knew that ahead of time. If it had been good news, the sergeant would have called her up right away, or Mama would have called her up, or Mama would have just appeared at the house. Father Joseph and Sergeant Gordo arrived late. The two men and Cousin Eunice sat in all the chairs there were in the living room. After she had passed around the teacups, milk, sugar, lemon, and cake, Dicey sat on the floor. She was wearing one of the stiff dresses Father Joseph had brought. Cousin Eunice twittered as she poured tea, then fell silent. We have located your mother, Sergeant Gordo said. He held a teacup in one hand and a plate with cake in the other. He could neither eat nor drink because he had no free hand. He looked around for a table to set the plate on. Cousin Eunice made a little, oh, sound at the news. I thought so, Dicey said. I don't have anything good to tell you, Sergeant Gordo said. I didn't think so, Dicey said. She made her face expressionless. You're a smart kid, the sergeant said. Your mother is in a state hospital in Massachusetts. She was found in Boston. She, do you know the term catatonic? Dicey shook her head. It means the patient won't respond to anything. Your mother, well, she doesn't do anything. Doesn't speak, doesn't seem to hear what's said to her. Won't feed herself, won't move at all. Not even to go to the bathroom. 
When they found out about her family, the doctors tried talking to her about you. No response. No response at all. Nothing. They think she's incurable. Dicey nodded. Are you sure it's Mama? Her fingerprints matched the ones the hospital took when you children were born. Why did they do that? Dicey asked. She didn't know why she asked. She didn't care what he answered. So the mothers and babies can be sure they go together. Then they, then they do the baby's feet so nobody gets mixed up. Oh, and I've got a picture. Daisy took the photograph. She looked at the vacant-faced woman lying in bed, her hair cut off short and her hazel eyes staring at the camera without any expression, as if the camera and photographer were not there. Her face looked so flat and empty, so far away as if it hung miles above the earth and could not be bothered by anything happening on the little planet below. They cut her hair, Dicey said. Are they sure she's incurable? These head shrinkers are never sure of anything, but they're as near to sure as they can be. I could go see her, Dicey suggested. I wouldn't do that, little girl. They'll get in touch with us, with us if there's any change, and then maybe it might do some good. It would be best to forget her, Father Joseph said. What if I don't want to? Dicey demanded, angry. I didn't mean that, child. I meant it is better not to have false hopes. Dicey clamped her mouth shut. Poor Liza, Cousin Eunice said. She's only five years younger than I am. Do you know that? Cousin Eunice poured out more cups of tea, which Dicey passed around. The adults talked around her and above her about adoption procedures and welfare applications. Sammy is on trial here, Cousin Eunice said to Father Joseph. He nodded. As is Maybeth, he answered. Cousin Eunice shook her head but didn't say anything. Dicey walked out of the room. She heard Cousin Eunice start to call her back and Father Joseph say to let her go. Maybeth was asleep and so was Sammy. James wasn't. Dicey undressed and lay down on her cot. Her mind was blank. What about Mama? James whispered. How'd you know? That policeman. They came in a police car. Mama's gone crazy, Dicey reported in a flat voice and they don't think she'll ever get better. She's in a mental hospital. She was in Boston. How do you think she got to Boston? James sat up. What kind of crazy? The kind where you just lie in bed and don't do anything, James. Do you think Maybeth's like Mama? Yes. Do you think Maybeth could go crazy like that? Yes, if she had to. You know, Mama had four kids and no job. Our father walked out on her. But we were happy, weren't we, when we were in Provincetown? We were, I know it. Mama wasn't crazy then. Maybe. I don't know, Dicey. Does that mean this is our home? Yeah, I guess so. I don't know, James. Would you like that? It's a good school, James said. I've never been in a school like this, where the teachers all know so much, and they like it when you ask questions, and they keep giving you more work. Nothing bothers the fathers, you know. Oh, swearing and things, those... But they're so sure they have the answers they don't mind you asking questions. In this school, I'm really glad I'm me. I can learn anything. Do you know how that feels, Dicey? The fathers show me and how when I learn. You better believe I'm happy. Should we tell Sammy and my Beth? About Mama? I guess so, sometime. Not right now. Or is right away better. So they woke the two younger children and told them the bad news. My Beth just nodded and sat closer to Dicey on the cot. Sammy stuck his chin out. She'll still get better, maybe, he declared. How do they know so much anyway? I don't care what they say. I won't believe them. Dicey grinned at him, unable to stretch her mouth wide enough to let out all the feelings his silly stubbornness let her feel. Then she began to cry. I'm sorry, Dicey, Maybeth said. Me too, Dicey said, burying her face in her sister's hair. I'm sorry, too. Now she had to go on Monday and find out fast what Chrisfield was like, what their grandmother was like. Cousin Eunice would flutter and flitter, and before they knew it, the Tillermans would be adopted, or something worse. It was not that Dicey was ungrateful. They might end up here. Cousin Eunice's house might be the best place for them, even for Sammy and Maybeth. It might be the best they could do, even if Sammy and Maybeth had to go somewhere else. But Dicey had to know that for sure. That weekend, she took the family to the beach. She was especially careful to pay attention to them. She laughed at Sammy's jokes and turned cartwheels on the sand with him and tossed him up over her shoulders into the water until he was exhausted. She built castles with Maybeth, decorating them with bits of shell and colored stones, telling stories about princesses and giants. She talked with James about history and science, listening with all her brains so her questions would show that she was really interested. 
Monday morning, she walked them all to camp and school. Sammy hesitated at the gate and said, I wish it was always the weekend. Dicey ruffled his hair. Maybeth let, let go of Dicey's hand and walked slowly over to where the little girls were gathering. Her dress was too long for her. She looked clumsy. Dicey asked James to pick up the little children. I'll leave the door unlocked. I've got something to do, she explained. Can you get them at the end of the day? And don't be late. Maybeth worries. James happily over his... James smiled happily over his pile of books. Sure thing, he said. He ran up the steps to the doorway and turned to wave before he went inside. Dicey hurried back to the little gray house. She had already told her customers she was taking the week off. She pulled the overnight case from under her bed and put underwear, toothbrush, clean shirts, and shorts into it. She put in the shoebox with the money, the bus schedule, and her map of Maryland. She would wear a dress for traveling. Downstairs, Dicey wrote a hasty note to James, asking him to take charge until she got back, telling him where she was going, saying she was sorry, but he would have to tell Cousin Eunice. She put her house key into the envelope and sealed it. She wrote James's name on the front and left it on the kitchen table. Suitcase in hand, Dicey opened the front door. James sat on the stoop. I thought so, he crowed, laughing at her as she stood open-mouthed, the suitcase in one hand and the doorknob in the other. You can't fool me. I left you a note, Dicey said. I've got to hurry or I'll miss the bus. The next bus doesn't leave Bridgeport until 10, James answered. You've got a whole hour, he smirked at her. James, Dicey cried. You've been snooping in my things? And here comes Sammy, right on schedule, James said. I told him when I found that money box. Besides, there was that man at the park, the grocer. I'd make a good detective. We're going with you. I don't have enough money, Dicey said. What about Maybeth? You'll think up a way, James said. Where are we going, anyway? But what about your school, Dicey asked. I mean, you're the one who's really happy here. I will come back, you know that. How do I know it, James told her. I know you mean to, but what if you can't or don't? I wouldn't do that, Dicey protested. How do you know? How does anybody know? I don't want you to leave me behind. Besides school, well, Dicey, listen, it's me that makes the school so good. My brain. Other kids don't like it as much as I do. So there are books all over the world and libraries. The fathers help me an awful lot, but there must be other schools with good teachers, even if there aren't. I'll always be me. Are you sure, James? I'm sure I want to go with you, and so does Sammy. Dicey couldn't think clearly. She couldn't think at all. Sammy marched up to them. I crossed four streets with lights, he answered. Hi, Dicey. I didn't believe James, but he was right. Dicey didn't even try to argue further. They all went back inside. She sent the boys upstairs to get changes of underwear for everyone in shorts and shirts. She changed into shorts herself. She wrote another note to Cousin Eunice this time, a note much harder to write. Dicey knew that Cousin Eunice wouldn't understand no matter what she said. We are going to Crisfield, she wrote. I don't want you to worry about us because I will take care of everyone. I don't know what will happen there. When we find out, I'll write to you. Dicey chewed on the end of the pencil and tried to think of some way to let Cousin Eunice know that they were grateful to her. No matter what happens to us, I think you should go ahead and become a nun because it is what you really want to do, she wrote. Your cousin, Dicey Tillerman. Once again, she put the house key in the envelope and sealed it. Dicey went alone to fetch Maybeth. The boys waited at the corner with the suitcase. Dicey walked right into the playground. Groups of little girls ran around. The young nun approached her. Dicey took a deep breath. I've come for Maybeth Tillerman, she said. I'm her sister. Sister Berenice said I should pick her up now. The nun, she lied. The nun hesitated. She squinted her eyes at Dicey. You can go and ask Sister Berenice if you like, Dicey said. But then we'll be late for Maybeth's appointment and she'll be angry. The nun called Maybeth from the sandbox where she was playing alone. Dicey took the little girl's hand and walked slowly through the gates. She had to hold herself back from running. Where are we going? Maybeth asked. We're going to see the place Mama lived in when she was a little girl, Dicey answered. All of us together? All of us together, Dicey said. That's the only way the Tillermans travel. So like I said, we're on to a new chapter in more ways than one. I hope you guys are still enjoying this. Um, please give it a thumbs up if you did. Please Feel free to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you never miss any of my uploads. And I will be back soon. I can't promise tomorrow, but definitely soon with the next chapter. And it's officially part two of the book. See? Part two. So we're moving on to a whole new series of events in the Tillerman's lives. Anyway, thanks for watching and listening. And I'll be back soon with more stuff. Bye, guys.